Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in March of 2020, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and on this service, on Sunday morning broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our shared faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, this fall, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In a time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? This is, as Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. And this right here, right now, is where we practice. And as Susan Frederick Gray puts it, this is no time to go it alone. And so this right here, right now, is where we practice together. So take a moment as we begin. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here. Set aside what will come later. Just be right here together. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. Our chalice lighting words this morning are by Ma Teresa Tet Gustillo Gallardo. We cast not our eyes below. We say to ourselves, we are how we came, wounded from struggles, triumphant in our survival entitled by birthright to belong to this, the only humankind there is, saying, I am included, I belong, I am here and I will be and do, I will breathe joy into a desolation, I will breathe peace into conflict, I will breathe life into destruction, I will be the earth I wish to see, I am growth and hope and glee. Forget your perfect offering, forget your perfect offering. Ring the bells that you can ring, ring the bells that you can ring. There is a crack in everything, there is a crack in everything. That's how, that's how the light, the light gets, gets in, that's how the light gets in, that's how.
This reading is from the Lubavitch Rebbe. If you see what needs to be repaired and how to repair it, then you found a piece of the world that God has left for you to complete. But if you only see what is wrong and what is ugly in the world, then it is you yourself that needs repair. Hello. Our story today is called Something Beautiful by Sharon Wyeth. When I look through my window, I see a brick wall. There is trash in the courtyard and a broken bottle that looks like fallen stars. There is writing in the halls of my building. On the front door, someone put the word die. Where I walk, I pass a lady whose home is a big cardboard carton. She sleeps on the sidewalk, sometimes wrapped in plastic. I run past a dark alley where mommy told me I must never stop. Behind a fence, there is a garden without any flowers. Mommy said that everyone should have something beautiful in their life, even if it's just something simple. Where is my something beautiful? My teacher taught me the word in school. I wrote it in my book. B-E-A-U-T-I-F-U-L, beautiful. I think it means something that when you have it, your heart is happy. I go to Miss Delphine's diner. Hi there, sugar pie, says Miss Delphine. What are you up to? I'm looking for something beautiful, I tell her. Sit down for a minute, she says, as she goes to the grill. She puts on fish, the fish sizzles. Miss Delphine makes it into a sandwich. There's nothing more beautiful than tasting my fried fish sandwiches, she tells me. My teeth sink in, mm, this is good. When I go back outside, I see some of my friends. Do you have something beautiful, I ask them? I have my jump rope, says Sybil. I have my beads, says Rebecca. Check out my new shoes, says Jamal. My favorite fruit store is one beautiful store, says Mr. Lee. You do have nice apples, I say. Thank you, says Mr. Lee. Take one. Watch my move, says Mark, playing ball in the playground. Hear my sound, says Georgina, dancing on the sidewalk. Touch this smooth stone, says old Mr. Sims, sitting on his front steps. All these years, I've carried it in my pocket. And through the big window in the laundrette, I see Aunt Caroline holding baby Carl. And where are you off to, little miss, she asks me. I'm looking for something beautiful, I say. She hands me Carl and folds up the clothes. I tickle Carl and he giggles. He makes me giggle too. My baby's laugh is something beautiful, says Aunt Caroline. I go back home and sit on my stoop. I look at the trash in my courtyard. I see the word die on my door. I go upstairs and I get a broom and a sponge and some water. I pick up the trash. I sweep up the glass. I scrub the door very hard. When dye disappears, I feel powerful. Someday I'll plant flowers in my courtyard. I will invite all my friends to see. I will give a real home and a real bed to the lady who sleeps in a cardboard carton. She will sing and I will hear her song. Mommy comes home from work. She gives me a great big hug. Do you have something beautiful? I ask her. Of course, she says. I have you. And although that is the end of our story, I hope that you too can think about the beautiful things that are in your own life. There's no combination of words I could put on the back of a postcard, no song that I could sing, but I can try for your heart. Our dreams, they're made out of real things, like a shoebox of photographs.
with sepia tone loving. Love is the answer, at least for most of the questions in my heart. Like, why are we here? And where do we go? And how come it's so hard? It's not always easy, and sometimes life can be deceiving. I'll tell you one thing. It's always better when we're together. It's better when we're together. Jack Johnson. As you listen to this next song, please feel free to type your name or the name of someone you hold close to your heart. Allow us to help lift up your name or their name in joy or in sorrow. Thank you for your presence. One by one, everyone comes to remember we're healing the world one heart at a time. One by one, everyone comes to remember we're healing. reading is excerpted and adapted from the Book of Wikipedia. In 1954, William Golding's novel Lord of the Flies was published. Its plot, extremely briefly summarized, is as follows. In an indeterminate year soon after the Second World War, in the midst of a wartime evacuation, a British aeroplane crashes near an isolated island in a remote region of the Pacific Ocean. Six boys play pivotal roles. Ralph, Piggy, Jack, Roger, Simon, and Samnerick. There's tension throughout the book between Ralph, the boy's first elected chief, and Jack, the leader of a group of choir boys. Piggy, bespectacled and overweight, is Ralph's lieutenant, and Roger is Jack's sadistic henchman. The conflict escalates until by the end of the novel, the boy's tiny society is in ruins. Jack and Roger rule all. 
Piggy's glasses, the boy's only way to make fire, have been smashed. The conch, symbol of democracy and fair play, is broken. And all live in fear of the beast, the lord of the Ordinary Seaman D slash JX 240266 joined the Royal Navy on December the 18th, 1940. A school teacher, he completed basic training, then traveled north to the British naval base at Scapa Flow in the Orkney Islands. He was soon involved in the pursuit and sinking of the German battleship Bismarck. His chief feelings, he remembered later, were misery, humiliation, and fear. Later, promoted to lieutenant, he commanded a landing craft tank, parentheses rocket, in the assault on Gold Beach during the D-Day landings. Later, he was involved in the attack on the fortress of Walcheren. The fortress present, prevented crucial supplies from getting to the Belgian port of Antwerp. What he saw and experienced during the war affected him for the rest of his life. Later, he summed up his wartime experiences in this way. I began to see what people were capable of doing. Anyone who moved through those years without understanding that man produces evil as a bee produces honey must be, have been blind or wrong in the head. We know quite a lot about ordinary seamen, later Lieutenant D slash JX 240266, because after the war he wrote books, indeed won the Nobel Prize for Literature. At the heart of his body of work is his first novel. The novelist, of course, is William Golding. The novel is The Lord of the Flies. The book is taught in schools across the world and tell readers that their worst fears are true, that people deep down not only do evil but are evil. Lieutenant William Golding knew in his bones, knew from looking into his own heart, that civilization was just a thin veneer over our base impulses was simply the sheep's clothing concealing the wolf within. That message has always found an audience, and Lord of the Flies rapidly became extremely popular. Since its publication, it has been discussed in innumerable seminars, dissected in countless critical analyses, and inflicted on many, many teenagers in high school. What has rarely been discussed is whether it represents an accurate, if cynical, view of human nature or simply a nightmare from which one might awaken. If we believe the latter, are we blind? Are we wrong in the head? If we want to go looking for inner wolves, what better place to start the search than in the midst of a life and death battle? It's November 22nd, 1943. Night has just fallen and the Battle of Macon has begun. Samuel Marshall, in his dual role as colonel and historian, is there to witness it. American forces advance, but the Japanese counterattack in the middle of the night. The fierce fighting continues until dawn. And the next day, Marshall tries something unprecedented in combat reporting. He asks the soldiers what happened. Something startling becomes clear. Only about 20% of them had fired their weapons. Among 300 soldiers in a do-or-die battle, Marshall could identify only 36 who had pulled the trigger. No one ran away. All were in mortal danger, but they could not bring themselves to kill. Since then, Marshall's data has been squabbled over, denied, debunked, rebunked, but the evidence in its favour has piled up. 
Fewer than 50% of World War II veterans killed anyone. At Gettysburg, 90% of the muskets retrieved from the battlefield were still loaded. 12,000 of them were loaded twice. Loading your musket doesn't kill anyone. Firing it might. Concerning the Spanish Civil War, George Orwell wrote, In this war, everyone always did miss everyone else when it was humanly possible. Sociologist Randall Collins concluded, summarizing research in this area, that humans are hardwired for solidarity, and this is what makes violence so difficult. Sex, famously, sells and violence sells too, and pessimism and despair. But some at least of the claims made for evil are just bunk. There is room to entertain the Lubavitcher Rebbe's belief that if you only see what is wrong and what is ugly in the world, then maybe it is you yourself that needs repair. Speaking of bunk, would you like to hear about what actually happened when six schoolboys really did get stranded on a barren island in the South Pacific? I thought you might. Um, but first, come sing a song with me. Each week we take up a collection to support the work of our church. And there are many ways that you can give a contribution. You can send a check to 6300 A Street, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68510. Or you can log into your Realm account and give online. I think the easiest way to give is through text giving. To do that, all you do is text UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. And we've also put this information in the chat box. Thank you for your support of our work. is excerpted and adapted from Humankind by Rutger Bregman. 
The real Lord of the Flies began in June 1965. Six Tongan boys, pupils at St Andrews, an Anglican boarding school in Nuku Alofa, borrowed a boat from a fisherman. Sion, Fatia, Kolo, Tavita, Luke and Mano drifted for eight days with little food and water. On the eighth day they spotted the rocky island of Atta, nowadays considered uninhabitable. Peter Warner, the captain of the ship that rescued the boys 15 months later, recalled, By the time we arrived, the boys had set up a small commune with food garden, hollowed out tree trunks to store rainwater, a gymnasium with curious weights, a badminton court, chicken pens and a permanent fire, all from handiwork, an old knife blade and much determination. It was Fatai, later an engineer, who after countless failed attempts managed to make a spark using two sticks. While the boys in the make-believe Lord of the Flies come to blows over the fire, those in the real-life version tended their flames so that it never went out for more than a year. The kids agreed to work in teams of two, drawing up a strict roster for garden, kitchen and guard duty. Sometimes they quarrelled, but whenever that happened they solved it by imposing a time-out. The squabblers would go to opposite ends of the island to cool their tempers, and after four hours or so, Mano remembered, we'd bring them back together. Then we'd say, OK, now apologise. That's how we stayed friends. Their days began and ended with song and prayer. Kolo fashioned a makeshift guitar from a piece of driftwood, half a coconut shell, and six steel wires salvaged from their wrecked boat, and played it to help lift their spirits. And their spirits needed lifting. All summer long it hardly rained, driving the boys frantic with thirst. They tried constructing a raft in order to leave the island, but it fell apart in the crashing surf. Then there was the storm that swept across the island and dropped a tree on their hut. Worst of all, Fatai slipped one day, fell off a cliff and broke his leg. The other boys helped him back up to the top. They set his leg using sticks and leaves. Don't worry, Sion joked, we'll do your work while you lie there like King Taufa'oua Tupo himself. The boys were finally rescued on Sunday, September 11th, 1966. Physically, they were in peak condition. The local physician, Dr. Posesi Funoa, later expressed astonishment at their muscled physiques and Fatai's perfectly healed leg. Kindness, cooperation and empathy don't make headlines the way evil does. As a result, it can sometimes be hard to keep yourself afloat in the sea of sad and bad things that are out there, since it's the hard things occupying all the attention. And it doesn't help if we've been predisposed to see the worst in the world by works such as Lord of the Flies. But Golding's vision of the world is dangerous. If we believe most people are out for themselves at our expense, we'll be less inclined to be generous with what we have. If we believe that other people pose a risk to our safety and well-being, we'll be less inclined to reach out and make connections with new people. In order to keep up our energy and our motivation to heal our wounded world, we need to really re-examine the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we allow other people to tell us. Unitarians can fall prey to believing the story of the grim headlines or Lord of the Flies and become despairing about the amount of evil in the world. I suppose it's a natural outgrowth of our social justice work. If you're trying to feed the hungry or welcome the immigrant fleeing hardship, take care of the battered planet, we're brought up close and personal with the worst things humanity is capable of. But instead of listening to those pessimistic stories, tell yourself the true story of cooperation and mutual aid that the real castaway boys offered each other. Or tell yourself the true story that scientists have uncovered, 
we may be a hardwired impulse to empathy in our biology. In 2011, the National Institute of Health reported on testing with pairs of rats. One rat was allowed to roam freely in the cage, while the second rat was restrained in a clear tube in the center of this cage. The free rat could nudge the tube open to free its companion, and did so repeatedly in experiments. The free rats would even aid their fellow rat before snacking on treats that were available, meaning they had to then share the food. One, research, one researcher has said, all of this tells us that acting on empathetic feelings to help another in need is a biological, and in fact, a neurobiological mandate. It's hardwired in our brain. If these true stories from history and science aren't enough for you, and you prefer to fight fiction with fiction, may I suggest throw aside your copy of Lord of the Flies and instead pick up a copy of Lord of the Rings. You probably know the plot from the books by J.R.R. Tolkien or the films, but I'll quickly recap. Middle Earth is a peaceful place inhabited jointly by races of humans, elves, dwarves, and hobbits. Ultimate evil is threatening the land with violence, environmental degradation, and consolidated rule in one powerful villain. The various races band together to fight a traditional war on the battlefield, but behind the scenes, the day can only be saved by the least likely of the good guys, the hobbits. Hobbits are known for being bookish, stay-at-home, quiet creatures with no inclination for adventures or daring. But Frodo Baggins and his best friend Samwise Gamgee step out of their comfort zone and agree to make a dangerous journey to Mordor, where the heart of all evil is, to save their world. The hobbits even doubt themselves. The elf Lady Galadriel has to tell them, quote, even the smallest person can change the course of history. And the hobbits do. This story comes from the Arthur Tolkien, who served in the trenches of World War I. He fought in the Battle of the Somme in 1916, one of the costliest and bloodiest battles of that war. He lost many close friends. He saw firsthand the unfettered evil of war, just as William Golding did. But unlike Golding, Tolkien came back to write this series of novels that offer a hopeful view. In Lord of the Rings, the good guys aren't easily or uniformly successful. There's setbacks. There's times in which the allies disappoint each other. And there's moments of despair because the wicked outnumber the good. It's not easy to combat the destructive and cruel forces in the world. But Tolkien tells us we can't give up on hoping that there's more kindness than evil out there and that kindness can win the day. I'm suggesting that you should tell yourself that like Tolkien, you're not blind to the hard things of the world. You're aware people can do evil. But like Frodo and Samwise, like the real castaway boys, like the rats who've helped each other, you also know most beings are kind and will do the right thing. Tell yourself, even the smallest person can change the course of history. Tell yourself that story don't let anyone persuade you that we should give up on the world. Our closing words are from the poet Mary Oliver. This is from her poem to begin with, The Sweet Grass. I have become the child of the clouds and of hope. I've become the friend of the enemy, whoever that is. I've become older and cherishing what I've learned, I have become younger. And what do I risk to tell you this, which is all I know? Love yourself. Then forget it. Then love the world. Be at peace, beloveds.